everybody. Hi, Tracy. Hi. How are you? Just fine. Who have you got presenting with you today? Rebecca Dillon. Hi, I'm Rebecca, Rebecca Dillon. I'm, a, I'm over at the School of Physical Therapy. Oh, wonderful. It's nice to meet you. I've not met you before. I'm Susan nice to meet you. Center for Teaching and Learning. Adela was saying that they were going through a, a new upgrade. Is that what you called it, Adela? A new... Um, yes, it was, it, it was an update to their... An update. Yeah. Zoom. So maybe that's what. Oh, to Zoom. Yeah. So no problems today. Good. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You had that problem last week. That was a problem for you. I'm so sorry. Well, well I was embarrassed. I, I felt really hard. You shouldn't have been. <laughs> Erin covered nicely, I hear. She did. That's good. So you're all set up and ready to go. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So we'll just wait. We have an OER for that uh, Flip Academy. We're really very happy with it. I don't know if you've heard that. No, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, Robert Talbot's uh, Talbot book is uh, available in your digital collect, free digital collection. Good. So, yeah. Good. Well, I think a lot more is going to be available digitally from now on. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. yeah Mula. <laughs> We're going to take advantage of that simul unlimited simultaneous users. Yeah. If, if we got that, that's, that's great. Yeah. That's what, that's, that's how it's listed. So good. Yeah. Great. So, so the, the bait and switch with vendors is on and we've had a couple of, things where they tell a faculty person one thing and then we go and try and verify it, it's usually not, not fully true. Okay. The, so what, one of them was- How delicately you've put that, thank you. <laughs> the, I call it the old bait and switch, you know, the, the offer is not nearly what they say the offer is, so. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's too bad. Is this for like uh, commercial um, eBooks? Is that what the? Well, one one vendor was promising to help digitize, basically make digital uh, musical scores available, and the offer sounded like they were going to help digitize these things. But what they really wanted to do to do was license their product at a fifty percent discount. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like your graphic. Yes, that says it all. What's the graphic? I'm not seeing it. Oh, it's, it's under title slide. Oh, cool. yeah. I'm sorry. Duh. Oh, no. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <around. laughs> yeah. That's a Creative Commons graphic, by the way. Of course. I would expect no less. Yes. <laughs> I would expect nothing else but Creative Commons. Yeah, I like their things. <laughs> use them a lot. So Kathy, Rebecca, Rebecca has a double screen and she, it's so much smoother the way she's going to be able to do it with, with the links instead of having to stop sharing. She can, yeah. So Very she good. can just slide it over. She'll have it open yeah. and then slide it over. So it'll go a lot smoother. No, that'd be nice. Yeah. That's, that is the advantage of the double, old double screen. Mm -hmm. Are you working yeah. on your, are you working on your laptop, Tracy? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Everything's back to normal. Oh, no, I know. I, I wonder if that was a Zoom issue, though. I, I kind of feel like it was it an app issue and that it's resolved. Somehow it's been resolved. Yeah. Oh, and I need to upgrade my Zoom, too, I think. Uh -huh. it, otherwise, it's gonna, it'll do it for you on the 30th. Well, it'll and force you. cause me un unwarranted grief? No, I... no, it takes only, only seconds. No, oh, okay. It goes really quickly. What do I have to do to update on my own? Just uh, um, I think Robert, what what would you say? Go to the, go to my updates or something and see if there's something there. I went to Zoom.us. Is that where you were telling people to go, Robert? Uh, yeah, yeah, they got the help um, page up there, and um, again on the thirtieth, it should automatically uh, upgrade you. I wouldn't recommend doing it now because it will kick you offline for uh, yeah. the Zoom meeting. Oh, I'm not going to do it this very minute. I mean, I mean. <laughs> sometime this week. <laughs> I'm leery of doing updates just prior to a uh, meeting of any type. 
Right. And Murphy's Law is always in full effect. Right. We've had so much Murphy's Law. <laughs> oh, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think the 30th, so the 30th, that might be a Saturday. Is that right? It's today the 28th. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you believe so? Yep. Oh, so that's how you came in. And Patricia, good to see you too. Hi, I'm here. I'm <laughs> yeah. yeah. I realize I joined before time, and it's like you know what? I'm not gonna get into a conversation that <laughs> nothing allowed. I mean, other things <laughs> pertain to me. But yeah, I'm here. Thank you yeah. for putting this together. Hello. Oh sure. Hi, Lorena. Hi, Beth. Good to see you both. Hello. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm thankful we have this tool, but boy, do I miss people. <laughs> oh, I do too. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're trying to organize for orientation in the fall. And um, Dr. Lisa McDougal started a spreadsheet saying, okay, what can we do that we normally do in person that we could do ahead of time? And, and I, I'm going to miss meeting those students that are incoming. You know, it's, it's a great yeah. opportunity to meet them. Mm -hmm. So it'll just be wholly different. It will be, yeah. I've got a group of friends that do a, a Zoom tail, a Zoom cocktail meeting weekly. Mm -hmm. And by the time we get around to that at the end of the week, I don't want to do any more Zoom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Even for that. Yes. You should move that thing to Monday night, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Not even alcohol can, you know. <laughs> Sometimes the happiest moment of my day is my last when I turn off Zoom for the last time. I know. I was going to say the same thing. I had a group where we used to get together, and it has just sort of fallen apart. I, I think nobody wanted to do another Zoom meeting. But, yeah. Hey, Bonnie. Hey, how are you? Fine. Hi, Hi Bonnie. I may disappear. I have uh, kids. School's oh, out. Do you? School's out? School's out. So it, they did fine when everybody was going to school because they all went to their separate corners and did their remote working, but now it's not <laughs> very well in their ass school. <laughs> Is it a free for all? No, they just get bored being quiet. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, daughter's a, my daughter's a physician, so she's trying to do telemedicine. Her husband, uh -huh. federal attorney. So everything they do is, you know, confidential. Yeah. Blah blah blah. So when they're mm -hmm. um, when they're working, they <laughs> they close the door, huh? Bombed by little kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you the best, and or you may describe it as the worst Zoom experience by a faculty member that I've heard. And she oh. had a four-year-old and a baby. And mm -hmm. Office has French doors on it, so she was at, in a teaching in a class in her office, and her four year old child protected her in her office. Oh my, put the child protection lock on her doors. She <laughs> could get out, and he started crying because he realized his mommy couldn't get out. Oh and so no, in a oh, my. all of he... this is going on, and so she's like, Class is missed. She had. <laughs> out her window thank god she was on the first floor go around through the front door to get to him so that indeed is the worst story I've that is seen. yeah that's pretty bad <laughs> i would have called the fire department <laughs> <laughs> could you just break the pane in the glass she could have but i guess she decided that it was better for her to roll you know yeah crawl out the window, window. It, the it, absolutely door. That makes yeah. I, had, I had my sister's four children, two children and my two children. Kate was just a baby. I mean, she was like maybe a month or two old. And my oldest son, who at the time was four, <laughs> locked himself in the bedroom by mistake. And then he panicked the upstairs bedroom and he couldn't get out. And then I had my nephew who was five and my other nephew who was two. So I had like baby two <laughs> and five. So I just called the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to get him out. 
Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, and he my was sister probably was teaching, panicking. and my husband was out of town, and I didn't know what to do, so I just called the fire department, and they came in about two seconds, and they the boys were flabbergasted that <laughs> <laughs> last time they, I think they were. But, but they they got the ladder and they they t took a ladder and climbed up and opened the window and got in and opened it. I live in an old house and it had this. I didn't I didn't really actually know there was a lock on the door, but there was no. It was like one of those kind of locks that you can't only turn from one side and there's no way to open it from the outside. Oh. He took the hinges off the door. But the fireman looked at me and he said, he he said, how old is the child in the locked in the room? And I said, he's three. And he just looked at me and I just said. They're not all mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that one is not blamed. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi. Hi. Hi, this is Patsy. Hello, everyone. Hi, Patsy. Hi, Patsy. Hi. Hey, Laura. I just saw you. How are you? Hi, Susan. Hi, Paul. So we have to update Zoom. Is that what you were saying, Kathy? Right. So yeah. So Zoom, um, they're going to force an update on, on May thirtieth. So it's um, it's just a security update, and you can go you can go to zoom.us and then download the update. Um, Zoom. Yeah. Dot us and upload and upload the uh, update. Okay. Update and it it might even say just download meeting client. That's the update. What is a meeting client? client. Yeah, okay. we should meeting. Okay. We should pull it up at the very yeah, end. It looks like yeah. Hey Robert, Robert, can I put you in charge of that? At the very end. I'll um, see about sending out the um, the link up there. Okay. Uh, could you could you even share your screen and show people how to do it? Uh, sure. Uh, let me um, reboot. Um, apparently my um, Zoom session. I can't get to the uh, button, so I have to. Log out, log back. Okay. Back. Okay. Okay. And we'll make you the last event. Okay. Yeah, I'll make you the last event. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the ticket out the door. <laughs> yeah. So I can't see everybody who's in the room. Uh, I only see five faces. Is I'm sure we have more than five. How many people do we have? We have twenty-one. Twenty-one. 21. 21. Yeah. That's great. It looks like Paul Anderson's in the house. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you just let me know when you're ready for us to begin. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll we'll get you. We always yeah. Wait. We'll get you going at two o'clock. No problem. We, we wait right till the. We wait till times the on the dot because people come in. Yep. There I am. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Tim. How are you? Hi, it's going great over here. Hi. Hi, Esther. That's a nice background. How are you? Thank you. I think I'd change. I change. I should change it now. <laughs> You'll just make us jealous. Oh, oh I, like, I love that one too. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Very desertic. Yeah. Very, desert. <laughs> yeah, very, very desert. desert. <laughs> Okay, right. so yeah. it is two o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. So let me introduce Tracy Mendoza, who's the uh, uh, Dean of the Libraries, and Rebecca Dillon, who's a librarian at the School of Physical Therapy. And they're gonna talk to us about online uh, educational resources, something uh, Tracy has a real passion for, not to mention a lot of expertise. So Tracy, let me send it, uh, send it over to you and Rebecca. Hi, how are you? First of all, thank you for Zooming with us today. I know, you know, your time is valuable and I hope you find this session valuable. Uh, we've done a couple of these workshops before, uh, but we're gonna go through some basics of open educational resources and no additional cost and how UIW now defines those terms, why they had to define those terms and let you have some thoughts you might need to consider if this is the right path for your particular course. So uh, one obvious benefit to open educational resources that most people think about is the cost avoidance for students. On average, college students about seven, spend about $700 per semester on commercial textbooks. And so that's an obvious one, but there are some other reasons why you may wanna go down this path. And there are some considerations of why you might not wanna go down this path. And we'll go over a lot of this today. Rebecca? 
Certainly. So our goals for the day are to define open educational resources and no additional cost resources to tell you what they are and what they're not. We're going to touch on Senate Bill 810 for Texas. We'll be identifying the benefits and the drawbacks for open educational resources and no additional cost resources. We'll highlight what the research says about OER. We're going to introduce some sources regarding open educational resources and no additional cost resources, including the health professions. We'll make note of some things to consider and help you decide your path on whether to do OER or NAC. We, and then at the end, we'll provide the contact information for the appropriate staff and areas of service. This, and one thing I do want to say is that we will share our slides with all the links with all the attendees today. So you don't have to write these down. We will make sure that you have access to this. But first of all, let's go ahead and define what open educational resources and no additional cost are. And this screen kind of gives you, oops, not yet. Nope. Nope, not yet. Let me go back to the, the uh, I, one thing that you'll have to know is for something to be an open educational resource, it has to allow certain things. So it either has to be in the public domain or it has to allow you to be able to reuse it, revise it, remix it, redistribute it, and retain it. And we'll go over in detail what that means with Creative Commons licensing. Also want to talk about what no additional cost is. And typically, this will allow a faculty member who says, I really like that resource that's available and licensed or purchased through the library and use it in lieu of a commercial textbook, that's no additional cost. What it is not is something called an inclusive access publisher bundle. And the example of that would be there are some um, bundles in SPS that I know about where they roll in the cost of the course material, which is a commercial cost, into the cost of the course. If there is a cost, it cannot be OER, okay? But it can be NAC, so we'll talk about that. All right, Rebecca, I'm ready to roll out those UIW defined terms. Uh, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about the Senate bill that launched the purpose for why we did this in, in a little bit, but UIW had to define these terms because of a Senate bill that was passed in 2017. So this is going to be available for anyone to review. This has been through the administration, it's been through the faculty Senate. So the actual definitions of it, what no additional costs are listed here, as well as OER, and then if you'll scroll to the bottom, the low cost materials. Now, and I know Bonnie was in on this discussion when we uh, first started talking about this, is that dollar figure has a little bit of flexibility. But the reason we needed to define these terms is the state decided that we had to do some things, which I'll talk about later. So we all had to be on the same page with what we meant by open educational resources. And I will go into great, greater detail about this in a little bit. Okay, on this slide, we've listed some of the benefits and drawbacks of OER and NAC. Most of the benefits deal with the flexibility, immediacy, and ability to tailor the resources to the student body. Most of the drawbacks have to do with the time it takes to tailor and vet the resources. Consider the heavy lift of fully curating or creating an educational resource versus taking an already created and vetted OER or even a commercial product. Basically, creation takes a lot of time. Another benefit is the possibility of getting grant funding due to Senate Bill 810. Tracy, did you want to expand on that here? Yeah, if you'll open that, that first link. Um, this is a, on our OER lib guide, which I'm going to talk about in great detail. But the reason I wanted to talk about the Senate Bill first is I've had some faculty ask why we're even doing this. <clears throat> in 2017, the state required all institutions of higher education to identify in the scheduling and in the registration systems courses that they define as open. And we have, we have expanded that definition to include no additional cost and low cost. And the reason for this is they say that if a student is in a sec looking for a psychology section, for example, they can look through the description of that section and find which courses are open, which in other words means they will not have to purchase a course textbook material. 
This was required by the state. So they said, not only does it have to be in your registration system, not only does it have to be in your schedule, but your bookstores have to have a way for students to look for these kinds of courses as well. So there's a low tech way we're gonna do this. UIW will create a web page of all the courses that meet this definition and eventually we'll roll to a high tech methodology, which is there'll be a searchable attribute in our banner system. And that of course is gonna take a little bit of work. But that's why I really wanted to define these terms and explain why are we even doing this. So I'm sure if there are questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. But this one page here does answer all that. Rebecca, if you'll scroll, scroll down on that page for me just a little bit. <clears throat> on uh, this page? Yes, it, right there. I, I just wanted you to see, this is where it talks about the specific things like the textbook has to, the textbooks have to be listed. So all this information is a linked on this LibGuide. Thank you. So things to consider when faculty are trying to decide, do I really want to go down the path of either identifying a fully created open educational resource, or do I wanna create my own, or do I wanna curate? Those are the, the heavier lift. So for example, one of the things like, in any time you're looking at, and instructional materials, does it meet your purpose? And of course, the only person who really can answer that would be the instructor teaching the course. But there are some tools to think about is not all OER are created equal. So the authoritative usefulness can be adjudicated with some rubrics that are available. Will you open that webpage for me, Rebecca? This is a, a, an organization called Achieve that have developed some strong rubrics that, that faculty can use in deciding whether the rubric really does meet their need or is quality. Sometimes these OERs are already peer reviewed. That information will be available as well. So this is just one example of how you can decide whether the OER is, meets your standard. Now, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about Creative Commons because when we talk about open educational resources, remember we said it either has to be in the public domain or it has to allow those five R's. And usually that happens with some kind of Creative Commons licensing. And I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but Creative Commons is an organization that uses sets of labels to identify what rights you have to use that material. There are three layers to any kind of license, and two of them probably don't matter to you. One is legal, and the third one is machine. But the one that you're gonna pay attention to is that human information, the common language. So the kinds of licenses that you will see on, on open educational re resources have these kind of icons. That first one, CC BY, means created commons by. And all it's saying is you can use this in the way that you want as long as you, you say that I was the creator. So you give an attribute to it. The other one, the, the second one is, this is a CC by SA, which says, you can use this as long as you give me an attribution, but you have to share your content that you create from this in the same way that you took it from me. And as you go through all of these, there are a few more I wanna point out. The ND stands for no derivatives. So in other words, they're saying, you can use this, but I don't want you to create anything else from it, kind of use it the way it is. And the last one that you'll see a lot is the non-commercial. And, and we do see that more with our STEM and our health professions uh, OERs than we do with uh, social sciences and humanities. This will be linked off the LibGuide. It will be linked off the PowerPoint. So you're, you're welcome to go back and look at this. So all of these um, Creative Commons Im images, like the first one on the, on the front page of the PowerPoint was a Creative Commons that said I could use it any way I wanted to. The other kinds of things that you want to consider when you're deciding if you want to go down an OER path is do you have an appropriate way to share that information with your students? So what kind of devices and platforms do you have? Sometimes the creator of the OER will let you use their platform and sometimes you will have to use the platform for your learning management system. So is there any problem with loading the information, ease of access, and that can all be tested before you decide what you want to do. I'm going to read the. I'm going to talk about the last uh, stable and current. What I mean for that, for no additional cost. 
if you decide that you want to do a cost avoidance for students, but you want to use anything that the library provides or that you that your department may purchase for students, it is no longer an OER, that, but it come, becomes a no additional cost because it's not an open license. The things you kind of need to think about for no additional cost is, is it stable and current? And that's where the discipline li li liaison librarians can help you. There's a, one for each, no additional cost, that's right. Uh, it just means, for example, if you wanted to use that article from that publication or that ebook, what you would want to know is that it's a stable resource and that it's available for your students when they want to use them. The last point I want to make is accessibility. So if you'll click on that page, I, I kind of want to talk about this. The reason I share this with, with faculty a lot is that I, I actually used to live in the realm of online learning, uh, being uh, the dean over distance learning. But one of the things that we would run up against is, as soon as you put it online, it has to meet the accessibility standards. It doesn't matter if it's in your course management system. It doesn't matter if it's on a web page. It doesn't matter where it is. As long as it's online, it has to meet the accessibility standards. And this is just a list of all the institutions who have found themselves in some kind of hot water for not meeting the accessibility standards for their online content. As you can see, it's a long list. So I just wanted to point this out that the thing to keep in mind is if you are using information for OER or NAC, we're gonna to have to figure out how to help you make it accessible. And that will mean either uh, labeling graphics, uh, transcripting, closed captioning for videos, those kinds of things. That's what the accessibility standards are. That's it. Now, when, when you're trying to decide things to consider with OER or no additional cost, one of the things I'd like for faculty to think about is ask yourself some questions first to see if this is really a path you wanna go down. So one of the first questions I've had people ask is, are you building the course for absolutely the entire world to use? And if you are, then you're probably gonna to wanna to use an open educational Creative Commons license or release it to the public domain. If you're building a course specifically for UIW and you want to use some UIW resources, then it automatically becomes an NAC. And Bonnie had asked me a question specifically. She said, I've created my own content. What is that? Well, once you create your own content, you own the copyright. So if you want to give a Creative Commons license, it can be an OER. Another question that I've had is some faculty say, well, I use a combination of OER, but I also want to use a combination of some of the library resources. It automatically becomes a no additional cost at that point, as soon as if it's not complete OER, it's not OER. Uh, so I think that kind of gives you some parameters on what path you might want to decide. This is just a little graphic and I have no idea what the green squiggles are. <laughs> I, didn't I don't do either. <laughs> uh, this is just a little graphic to demonstrate what I call the information that's available to you once you're, you're deciding on an OER or NAC path. The way that I would look at it is the narrower the focus will be, but the broader the information sources available to you. And I'll give you an example. If you are saying, I want to use all resources available to me and I only want my UIW students to have access, then that would be in the inner circle. So they're going to use the, your Creative Commons license, they're going to use the licensed materials from the resources, but they also have all OER. So in other words, think of it as the opposite. The broader access that you want, in other words, I want the entire world to be able to use this resource, the narrower the focus on the resources that you will be able to use to meet that goal. Okay, here we have some tools for getting started on using open educational resources. One of the main tools that we keep talking about is the library guide. Oops. The library guide here that we've created. It has information about what OER is and what the research says. Tracy, did you want to talk about the research? Yes, uh, one, and, and one other thing that we've gone over with our faculty is they want to know what the efficacy of OER is. And so there are several studies that have been done and what the research says under articles and more 
there's a lot of actual uh, studies and an analysis of research that's been done there. So if you will click on more for me. Where is that? Right, it's below. Resources? What, right. Where's oh. so the consumer? Yeah. Con, yeah, right there. And scroll down for just, they, they're right there. One of the things that I thought was useful for faculty is for you to be able to go to a hub where all of the resources and research for OER is being gathered. And so OER Research Hub and Open Education Group are constantly updating their web page and they're doing research in two areas. One is what is the impactfulness of learning using OER. So those are some studies that are being done. And the other one are just based on perceptions. What is the perception of the quality of OER? So those are two areas of studies that you can find here. <laughs> Did you want to touch on any of the other tabs? One, while we're one other thing, if you'll click on resources, and then under OER search, these are called meta searches. And so they are being compiled to look for OER as broadly as they can. We're gonna build guides that are discipline specific. That's our summer project where we're gonna actually break down OER by discipline and put them on this page. But in the meantime, if you just wanna go look to see what might be available in your discipline to support your course, you can use these two meta searches. Um, Oasis is a good one, but I also think the Mason OER MetaFinder is a good one as well. So these will be good places for you to start. Okay, the next point on the PowerPoint was uh, a link to the University of Texas Libraries. They have a very robust uh, set of information about OER, so we decided to put that link on here. And then we also have the Texas OER Landscape Survey. Now, this is a 35-page report on a survey conducted in 2019. The survey reveals insights into the priorities, practices, and perceptions surrounding OER across the Texas higher education landscape. The report concludes that those leading the way in OER across the state are appointing dedicated committees to shepherd the OER work at their institutions and are allocating resources to OER training for faculty and for the de development of OER. Which is then, not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we have a link to the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. That, that, that link would lead you to a whole bunch of other resources that they have. Next, we have the Texas Library, Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Again, there's a whole lot of links that can lead to other uh, open educational resources. But the reason we wanted to point this one out is this is also where you might find some grant money if you decide to go and start uh, creating OER. So you might find some money here. We wanted to talk about uh, learning, learning management system shells. When you're looking at OER, some of them might already have shells, but some of them might integrate very well into either Blackboard or Canvas, but it's one of the ways you can look at things when, you, when you're deciding. We wanted to mention that, of course, the librarians and instructional designers um, are here to help you. We are your co-curricular partners in this, and we, we want to help and help you lead in this area. And then we have an adoption worksheet and I think Tracy wanted to talk about this worksheet. All I'm gonna do is use this as an example as, as how one workshop for the, uh, I think this was Community College Consortia, developed a workshop shop to help faculty start developing OERs for their course. The one thing I will tell you is that they were focusing on a whole textbook, either curation, creation, or adoption. And as Rebecca said earlier, indeed, the easiest path to go is to look to see what might already be created. And she's gonna talk a lot more about these big textbook vendors, Open Textbook Network, OpenStax, and several others that have already created OER textbooks. And what we're advising faculty to do is look to see what's available. And you don't have to like everything about it. Let's say, like any other commercial textbook, there are probably things you don't like. 
But what you can do is say, I like 75% of this textbook, I'm going to go ahead and adopt it. And then we will help you with the, the curation of finding things that may take the place of the 25% that you don't. And this is just a worksheet to help do that. Okay, now I'm gonna kind of take over and show you what we've created for the health sciences. It's another OER live guide, but it's specific for the health sciences. So when you go there, you would come to a home page and it basically talks about OER. But then we have tabs for all the different disciplines within the health sciences. We have one for each of our professional schools, such as optometry and SOM. But we also have some areas that cross over all, such as anatomy and biology. Each of the pages are organized in about the same way. We start in the upper left with some textbooks. Now keep in mind, I, I have just chosen some that I hoped would pique your interest in these different areas. And I put the links to them. And if you click on the more, that's where you'll see the creative, creative Commons licensing if I was able to find that. So here we have some textbooks that nursing might like, like creative clinical teaching in the health professions or nursing care at the end of life. So these are some open uh, OER textbooks. If I click on medicine, I'll just show you uh, the second box in these, this first column is usually resources. And on these for medicine, I chose a bunch of different online course modules. Johns Hopkins is a wonderful source for these online modules that are already created, MIT as well. But in the resources, I also sometimes chose uh, interesting ones like this introduction to medical terminology. This one is a, an online interactive training course and I liked it because it had games in it. So when you're training on medical terminology, this one might be a neat one to link to for that. On each of the pages, I put some links to the health sciences databases. Some of these are embedded in the larger databases that are listed on the other um, resource page. But I put links that would uh, filter it into just the medicine or health. You might recognize the OER Commons. I really, really liked Merlot when I was creating this web sheet and I just wanted to show you right fast if I were to go to Merlot and search anatomy, I'd get 1,599 results. And then over here on the left, you could filter it out to just be online courses, online course modules, open textbooks. I did wanna say that even though this says it's a peer reviewed resource, I did find links to broken links and links to commercial web pages like a wound care product web page so i found it very useful to um, sort by overall rating instead of by relevance and there you could see where peers have reviewed these different sources and sometimes the editors so basically that brings the wheat up to the top and the chafe at the bottom so i really really liked merlot and that's why i kind of pointed that one out but also if you're looking for digital resources that we have Heal or OpenStax is a wonderful place to find OpenStax textbooks. Um, and then Oasis, I think uh, Tracy had mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's a, a meta finder. And then on each of the pages, I put the contacts in the bottom right. And I think that brings us to our next slide, which is communicating with our library staff. We have our discipline liaison librarians emails linked right here. And we have ask a librarian email always up. We have chat functions open. Whenever the library is open, you can get a real live librarian or library staff member to answer questions for you. Uh, and you can always call us. We have Ring Central going to our phones. I think that brings us to questions, Tracy. Wow, we went through fast. <laughs> oh, we want to make sure we got through before Zoom went down. <laughs> one, of, one of the things I, I definitely do want to hear your questions, and I was reading some of the chat, so I want to address some of the comments I saw in chat. But also, there's a quick little survey here that I hope you'll take when we send you this PowerPoint. And, and can you open the, the little survey for me, Rebecca? I think so. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this is why we didn't do it this way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So th this is just saying 
if you feel like you're going to be using OER in a future course, we're just kind of getting, you know, testing the waters to see how much interest there is in this. So it's just a quick little toe tap in the water survey. Uh, but I did want to kind of talk to you about some of the, the comments I saw in chat, and that is, uh, where do I find specific resources for my discipline? I can tell you that the absolute best thing to do is to contact the liaison librarian. You can certainly contact me, and I will get you started, but then I will refer you off to one of the discipline librarians as well. We will, our, one of our summer projects is to truly build out the discipline OER libguides this summer. So we're working on building that. So those meta finders are also good places to start. Um, and then I, the, the question about if a commercial textbook vendor will allow their thing to be used as OER, and I can tell you for a fact they won't. However, if you find that you really truly like a commercial textbook and you're saying, but I really like the idea of cost avoidance for students, the liaisons will help you see if there's something that's equivalent that may serve your purpose that really are either an OER or a no additional cost answer to that problem. Uh, Rebecca is showing you wh where these libguides are linked off the, can we start from the main page, Rebecca, and show them how to find it? This is the, the library's main page. And when you click on the main page on the right will be quick links and the top link is called research guides. And we have created several kinds of research guides. Some are specifically for courses, some are disciplines, but then we have these things called topics on the right. They're listed alphabetically. And so both big OER libguides are right here in this column. May I also put a little push in for this four faculty libguide that we created? I think this is a very handy during our current off-campus situation. Are there any other specific questions that we didn't answer? Let me read the chat. So one of the questions is, can I create an OER for a certain department and then let uh, my faculty access it for teaching the course? My, my answer to that is absolutely. If you are creating an OER, then that means it's open access and anyone will be able to use it. So usually what happens when I, we start out with these questions, once we kind of have a conversation, it may be that you really truly want to do an OER or you may want to do a no additional cost. The answer for no additional cost is those absolutely can be used by anyone affiliated with UIW and UIW students. So that still can be used by our students and our faculty. One thing I'm gonna put in a shameless plug, because I'm shameless, and that is that we have done these workshops specifically for disciplines and for schools. And then that way, we still kind of go over the broad understanding of what this is, the reasons why you do and don't, but then we can actually concentrate on the resources that are specific to your areas of interest. Uh, the thing that I will talk, tell you that we may see in the future is as UIW gets more into this, if a course is designated as open, and we've, we looked at that sheet, what does that mean? If a, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I've seen at other institutions. I have no idea whether this will happen at UIW. Is that if, if there, we're talking about course sections, not courses. So for example, if Susan is teaching an English 1301 course, and we have Dr. Smith teaching uh, who, who's another English faculty, Susan, who might teach English 1301? Uh, Luella D'Amico. Okay, so, so if Luella teaches one and you teach one and Luella decides to create an OER, then the student we would eventually be able to go in and search banner by that attribute, which might say something like Cardinal Open and discover which sections of, the, of that course are open. So that's, the, that's probably the direction we will be going. I know that this is a lot and it's fast. That's why I'm saying if you want us to come and do, or do one specifically for your school or for your discipline, we're happy to tailor it to that need as well. Okay. I have a question. You, uh, Trace, let me ask you about no additional cost, which okay. is I think probably what we're using in the, the 
Flip Academy rather than OER because it's something that's housed in the Incarnate Word Library, right? It, it's a commercial, yes. It's a nice 2017 book by a really wonderful scholar. Why is it available, you know, for multiple uses? You know, how did we get this good? Because he, he allowed, I, and I don't know the specifics, but Kathy said she looked and it said multiple simultaneous users. Yeah. The license. The license trumps everything. If the license said one user at a time, then that would be the case. It's the license. So that was a choice he made and therefore... Um, that was a choice the publisher of that publication okay. made. Yeah. And if you want to send me the specifics, I'll look into it, but because I don't know. No, I was just mildly curious. Okay. Yeah, no, it's no additional cost. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, Tim. Yeah, um, if you go with an online uh, textbook, mm -hmm. um, is, is somehow the format and the text uh, set, uh, or are they updating all the time, and you might not know what's been updated or changed from either week to week or semester to semester? That's what I'm kind of wondering. Well, if hey Rebecca, go back to the draw the benefits and drawbacks slide for me. And one of the things I'm glad you asked that question. It really depends on who's creating the textbook. So so one of the the drawbacks about using OER is that you you will have to verify that it's current. However, for these these well established textbook OER creators like OpenStax, which of course is based at Rice University. At open textbook network and some of these others like MIT has entire courses they're going to most likely be updating and keeping that information current so the format for open I can I can talk about open stacks uh, uh, probably a little bit more definitive. Sure. if you found what's your what's your field what's uh, what, history and I've seen the rice um, US history textbook online okay but that was so, one of my questions you know what happens okay. with the thing let the the way open stacks works is you you say I'm I express interest. You will sign a form. So you will just it's all for their own data because they get grant money to to create these things. So they'll need their own data. Saying that I I want to use this and I will be using it in the fall and the spring. And then there may be some other questions. But the format is all, it looks like a published digital textbook. They have money. It looks great. And so and they in some cases they even have what I call value added. The, that's where they're really working right now is to add the things like the grading bank, uh, the, you know, the, supp the supplemental materials. These big OER vendors really have heard what faculty are saying. The other thing I'll tell you about OpenStax is that it has been vetted through a disciplined peer. Okay. And so the thing would, let's say, Tim, that you're interested in doing that. Somebody at UIW would need to know that you're doing that. So for us to be in compliance with Senate Bill 810, I don't necessarily know who that person would be, but I would ask that if you did it to at least let me know so I can make sure we track that, but most likely it would be your dean as well. Okay, great. Actually, let me follow up on Tim's question because I'm not sure I, I got the answer. So there's this fabulous thing that it's coming out of Rice and it's an American history thing and you said it's updated constantly. Does that mean next Wednesday what was on page 57 might be on page 82? No, it means- okay, tell me what it does mean. This is a textbook that is published until an updated one is published. Now the links inside may be updated, but th this is, this is like a stable digital textbook from like, think of it like that, like McGraw-Hill. They're not, they may go update web pages that go out sometimes, but they're not gonna necessarily change the content and the structure of the book more than- well, I can think of this having essentially this, well, it might not look the same, pretty much though it would function the way, oh, I'm in edition five. And it, there's know, a, this things is will an, stay pretty similar till we go to editions. Did Adela pull, pull, pull that up? I don't know who pulled it up. It's actually, the this is the history book they're talking about, I think. This is yeah. what it looks like. Yeah. So it was published in 2014. But it says the web version was updated in 20, 2020. Yeah, I think that might have to do with the instructor resources. So I'm not sure. Okay. But they have also added some value added, like the, the grade bank and things like that. I mean, here's the thing, Tim. If you are interested in this, once you said I'm interested, they would send you the information specifically for that textbook. 
and here's the lovely Cre Creative Commons licensing right there. I see Bonnie. Uh, oh, so Bonnie told me she, she used OpenStax last two semesters, but she didn't tell me. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody. I didn't know I had to. <laughs> well, you don't. The reason you want to is because we want to try and be compliance with that Senate Bill 810. So, for example, Bonnie, if it was pure OER, in other words, you didn't use any kind of commercial textbooks for that one section, then we would make sure that in the registration and in the uh, schedule that it said whatever designation. So, well, I did. I did use A grade. <laughs> I did use the. Um, I did use the Pearson uh, uh, online homework system with it, so it wouldn't have been. It, it wasn't. It wasn't, it wouldn't have even qualified for no additional cost, I guess, because it was like over, a, they had to pay like $100 for that. Okay, okay. But it didn't make them buy the textbook. Well, you know, that, that low cost, remember we talked about that designation called low cost material? Yeah. We just threw a number out there. It said $50, but that was debatable whether we wanted, that is definitely not up to me. So maybe that's something that needs to be looked at. Maybe $50 isn't enough for that low cost designation. Well, and then do, do we, uh, have we started, have we started putting that on courses? Or I think when well, I started, we were supposed we to have started. About we were what? supposed to have started. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not ready to say But, but the, the thing is, that's why we went through that definition and we we sent it through faculty senate so we could all be on the same yeah. page what we're meaning uh, right. I, just think, I think that COVID-19 threw us off schedule a little bit I believe that threw us off <laughs> schedule at a lot of yes. things <laughs> for sure but yeah. I do recommend it and I mean maybe they maybe there's some things that are changed but it's not any different than when you have a textbook the uh, commercial textbook because they change those things every two years just so they can sell you a more expensive copy. So oh, yeah. I'm sure that there's that much that it's any different than that, at least with OpenStax, it seems to be a pretty they're a pretty they're pretty good, actually. They're as good as and, and for introductory textbooks, they they are all kind of the same, you know, at least in for biology. See, but Bonnie, to me, that might be another benefit of using a, a using something that's already established instead of creating or curating your own. Yeah. Heavy lift of updating would be all on you if it was curation, creation, right. adoption. Yeah, I use the biology second edition. See, they're already on the second edition of the biology, so they do they do label their editions as well. So that might be another clue to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I, I will encourage anyone if they have any specific questions to just go ahead and send them to me and, and I will either try and answer you or I will farm you out to someone who has more discipline expertise. Um, but hopefully you'll be interested in um, maybe have us come and do a workshop for your school or your discipline. I'll tell you just one other thing about OpenStax that I found really helpful for my students is that you can download the entire book as a PDF onto your desktop so that they don't have to go onto the internet to use it. They can, uh, they can, they can have it on their device. And so if you have like an Apple device, you can put it into iBooks. That's what I do. So I don't have to go to the internet to look for something. And I think that's helpful for our students, especially when, if they may have at home internet issues that they can get it downloaded once and then they've got it. See that OpenStax, in many cases, see on the left, it says order a print copy. Yeah. So in some cases, some students may want to pay a small fee for a print copy. Yeah, or they can download a PDF. And that would yeah. still be OER because they're not required to pay that. Right. Mm -hmm. So Adela, where, what was the question? My email is uh, T-E-M-E-N-D-O-2. I'm Tracy Mendoza. Put it, I'll put it in the chat. There you go. Do we have any other questions? Please do, once you get the, the uh, PPT, answer our quick little survey. 
Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate everything that you and Rebecca shared with us today. All right. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. You too. Bye bye. Did thank you need you. us to hang on for what? Thank um, you very much. I think it was Robert was going to say something. Oh, oh that's right, Robert. You were going to show Robert. us that in our Zoom. Robert, you're muted. Robert, you're muted. Okay, you probably got it unmuted. Uh, let me start off by again sending the link there in the chat. Uh, let's see. So you can be on, get to the page. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen now. And I'll show you the uh, actual page. Okay, this is the uh, page that that link will send you to. And you'll notice it says that they will automatically update you on the 30th uh, to a 5.0 version. Also, let me see if I can get it, come back up here. It, um, since we're already in a meeting, if you click in the upper right hand corner, you got a little uh, green symbol. And you can click on that. And you can go ahead and do the check for update. And it'll automatically download the update for you. I won't do it right now. I'll just hit cancel. But again, it's a very simple uh, way of doing it. And if you don't want to do it, you know, just wait until uh, uh, Saturday or Sunday there. And it'll automatically do it for you. So that's all there is to it. Any questions? No, thank you. No, okay. Thanks a lot, Robert. Yep, thanks, Robert. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Yep, thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Bye.